What's going on? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. Uh, excited to talk about our topic today. We get into a lot of you know stuff that's not fly fishing. Fly fishing is definitely my passion. Sight fishing, uh, really sight fishing in general. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit about late winter fly fishing uh, in South Carolina and kind of uh, dive into uh, a program that that the guy that we've got on tonight has set up and. Uh, excited to to share that with y'all. But before we get into that, definitely go check out Eastern Current Fishing on Facebook. Uh, if you're listening on any of the podcast platforms, be sure to, to rate the podcast. It helps out a bunch. And uh, like the video on YouTube, subscribe to the channel. That definitely helps out a bunch. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring our guest on. And it is Mr. Tuck Scott. What's going on, man? What's going on? Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Thanks for coming on to the podcast and chatting with us for a little bit tonight. And I, I've uh, I dream of maybe having like a cool backdrop like that one day here, but you got the you got the killer setup right there right now. <laughs> it makes it easy in here. So yeah, it does. Be quieter in here than anywhere else. So I, I hear nice. that. Well, uh, why don't you start by kind of telling everybody where you're from, kind of how you got into fishing, and and how it's brought you to where you are today. All right, cool. Um, yeah, I I'm here in Beaufort, South Carolina. I'm a head fishing guide for Bay Street Outfitters. We've got uh, three other guides in house here. Um, and then, and I've been doing this, uh, guiding here and working for the outfitter since 2004. Um, and the, the way I kind of got into this, I grew up, my grandparents built a family vacation house down here, uh, on the whale branch river when I was three. Um, and I grew up mostly at coming to that house from, from Columbia and, uh, every long weekend and spring break and summer, Christmas, Thanksgiving, all that stuff. And we did a bunch of flounder gigging and shrimping and, and now I do next to no keeping anything. So, um, <laughs> I eventually transitioned into just wasn't happy after going to college, wasn't happy away from the water, tried a couple other things, actually ended up grad school for a little bit, just wasn't happy away from the water. So my, uh, the house that was in the family here was going to leave the family. So I moved back and um been here since oh four doing this so. that's awesome yeah that's, that's great. super cool uh it sounds like you sound like myself i didn't i wasn't born on the coast but lived in raleigh and we were here every weekend all the time and i was the same way i just had to be near the water man it's uh once it gets once it gets you it's hard to break away from it so yes it is um were you fly fishing at an early age or is that something you kind of came into a little bit later on in life yeah it's kind of a cool story of what happened there i was we were living on a about a 120 acre lake in a place called Blythewood, South Carolina, which is just above Columbia. And, um, the neighbor had a, some kind of spaniel and I was probably, I would guess I was probably 12, maybe 11 at the time. Yeah. And, um, and I was taking care of the dog and I came home after taking care of the dog at Nick Smith's next door. They returned and I gave him a key back and I walked back into the kitchen and my mom saw I had some money in my hand and my mom said well what what's that from and I said well the Smith gave it to me for taking care of their dog and I said well and my mom was like well you can just walk it right back over there um we don't uh we don't take money from the neighbors it's our neighborly duty to take care of the dog and I I'm sure I begrudgingly went back over there with that money and I gave it back to him and uh about two times later, taking care of that dog, they returned with a Martin fly rod set up. Wow. That they bought at Crack Barrel. And uh, knowing <laughs> that my mom wasn't going to l- let me take any money, they figured they'd let me take that, or she'd let me take that. So yeah. I grew up, and I'm trying to think. I'm, I could have been even younger. I guess really the math on that is probably closer to eight. So I probably, I know I started throwing a fly rod before I was 10. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and that would have been the one. So it was probably a little earlier than I said. So anyways... But I, uh, that's how I grew up starting with that. And then, you know, started weaving it into all the saltwater stuff I was doing down here. And, um, yeah, so I, I guess it's one of those things, I guess a little good karma that my mom instilled in me, you know, trying to teach me a lesson of having the neighborly duty turned into a career later. So (laughs) it was just meant to be, it sounds like it was all meant to be. That's right. Uh, how how early were or what age were you at when you kind of got into the saltwater fishing? Was that when you were traveling down there as a kid or? Yeah, I mean we were doing it then, but I don't know that I was throwing the fly to any salt. Um, I don't think I really did much of any saltwater fly fishing until probably probably high school age, and yeah. then 
Um, and then we started taking, I started taking some guided trips and stuff in college when I could scrounge up enough money to go make that happen, which probably was, would have done me a lot better to be in my 401k or something. <laughs> Um, life's too short to worry about all that. Turned into a career too. Yes, it, life is too short to do it that way. Oh man, well that's that's super cool. So, did you have a relationship there at Bay Street Outfitters, or did it, what was your kind of your, your story into as far as getting yeah, into so guiding? I fished. I guess when I was at Clemson, I'd come down and fish with a couple of the guides here at at the Outfitter. Um, one of which uh, David Murray is uh, still one of our casting instructors. Does awesome. a lot of our schools here for the Outfitter. Um, and then, but I don't know that I had much of a relationship. It was more once that house was going to get sold out of the estate and I uh, rented it from my parents, um, I came down, started working at a restaurant and was going to try to become a guide and ended up walking in the outfitter and the first night that I was to work at the restaurant and uh, I worked at that restaurant one night and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, this really is a story of like you know you were just destined to be a fishing guy yeah yeah I, I came in did some casting instruction for a while and spent a lot more time on on uh flats boat that i had and uh and ended up kind of you know i still still spend a lot of time working in the shop which is nice to have on yeah. windy days which we've had too much of lately oh, yeah. and uh and then i have plenty of plenty of time on the water too so it's nice Sweet. um so tell me just real quick as a, just a, I would like to know what, what kind of skiff are you running? Do you fit, do, you, do your fishing? Um, I run a, uh, Maverick, uh, HPX S carbon edition. Oh, sweet. You got the carbon one. Yeah. yeah it's you great. loving it? It's, it's amazing. It's amazing. I, uh, I definitely, definitely don't need uh, to come get on that with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's very, um, you know, I had the, the, re- the original S last and, yeah. uh, and, the the way that each boat handles when you're pulling it they're very similar um obviously that that loss of weight which i think is about 130 pounds you can you can feel the difference when you're spinning the boat you can definitely feel the difference when you're pulling through the grass because of being a little higher in the water column um and then uh and then the wind you know that boat has such low profile uh, yet stays really dry. I, do, I don't profess to understand the physics of it, but because of that low profile and just not picking up wind, um, the you know the one I had before was really nice pulling into the wind. But this thing's almost silly how effortless it is. So uh, yeah, it's been a great great skiff for me for sure. Right on. Yeah, I run an S as well, um, and I love that boat. And I'm like, you know, this is gonna be my forever boat. I'm gonna keep this boat. I'm gonna you know restore it when it needs to be restored, but. I had to come out with carbon fiber, and now I'm like, oh man, one day. Um, but it really is such a great pulling boat. I mean, it, it it and for this type of water that you and I fish, and it being pretty similar, that allows you to cover big water, like you said, comfortably, but also float and not necessarily that we're fishing all the time in six inches of water, but to be able to slide over little sandbars that keep you out of creeks right. and and get back to where the fish are, man, it it just lets you access fish that you really couldn't access on their flats boats. Um, yeah. yeah, that's super cool. How long have you, have you had that carbon boat? Uh, about five months now, maybe four, four or five months. Sweet. Um, yeah, I think the thing I was most worried about when I originally went to the S was I was worried that because it didn't have any sponsons that it was going to want to squat mm-hmm. and, you, and it was going to cause a problem when you were pulling it over, you know, especially if you didn't have much weight in the front or you had a little guy in the front or something or nobody in the front. But that that's just not the case. Yeah. You know? I mean, even if it, even if it does push down a little bit because it's so light, you know, it'll climb over or whatever. Right. So, right. Uh, I, I, yeah. And I, I can't say enough about how wind resistant it is. As you know, I mean, it, it just, the wind just doesn't affect it. It doesn't seem for really me. Doesn't. It really yeah. doesn't. Um, I don't understand. That's how it works. Well, tell people a little bit about, or kind of maybe a lot about kind of your fishery there and, and what, what, it has to offer as far as sight fishing goes and sure. um, you know not even season dependent it's just a from what i've seen a, an incredible fishery as far as redfish goes so uh, it, it really is and it's uh it starts with the fact that we while a very similar fishery 
that you see there in Charleston, that guys see up near you know McClellanville, all the way to guys see in, down in Jacksonville. Um, obviously, we all fish very similar water. Um, but one thing that we we have with uh, is just how much of this marshland water we have. Um, there was a lady that did a presentation here at the Outfitter years ago, and her her uh, numbers on how much water we have here were was that Beaufort County uh, has 25 percent of the entire United States East Coast marshland water. Wow. And, and it, when you really start, when you really look at it up and down the coast of the United States on the East Coast here, it, you start to, to believe it. But, it, you know, at face value from not thinking about it beforehand, I don't know that I would have thought that. But it, you really, we've, you just got two very big sounds that come in and make this horseshoe of water around uh, the island of Port Royal, which Beaufort is on, amongst tons and tons of other islands. Um, and yet some of it fishes very differently than, than other places. Some of it's tougher. Uh, I feel like during low water, because of all the fresh water that comes out of the Ace Basin into the top, you know, uh, the top of us up to the north of us and uh, the Cusaw River and into St. Helena Sound. Um, and then other places are more treacherous, like out front, um, right behind Fripp Island, uh, uh, and where we've got massive amounts of oyster mounds, yeah. uh, it's kind of more similar to something like Bulls Bay. Um, and then, and then we have generally some cleaner water, not always, but generally some cleaner water over in Broad River, uh, out of say, uh, uh, Port Royal Sound, um, because we don't have as much freshwater influence there. Right. Even though we've got three rivers at the top, they're much smaller than those rivers in the Ace Basin. Uh -huh. Um, and, uh, and so we have, you know, just like you'd see in all those, in all the places we, we fish in the low country, we have lots of nice tailing redfish flats in the warmer months that we can find those fish tailing on. Um, we do have a larger tide swing than anywhere else really in the low country. Um, and that has to do with, we're in what is referred to as a Southeastern bite. So when you have, when you look at a chart or a map, and you come up the coast of Florida, it kind of cuts in as it comes up Georgia, runs into us, and then it cuts back out. And so you get that apex right there, just like on a funnel, and that's why we end up getting more tide movement. And the farther back you come in, the more tide movement there is. Our tide movement out by Fripp and uh, in the Harbor River and places like that, Hunting Island State Park, all that, much more similar to the tide movement in Charleston, slightly larger, but not much. Whereas you come back in the Broad River, uh, which is not that far as the crow flies, but you come back in the Broad River, it's almost a foot more. Wow. So um, it changes a good bit in that. Whereas our, I, I don't know what your average tide is, but I would say our average tide movement here is probably 7.4, something like that. Yeah. Ours is about four and a half to five is an average tide. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, um, and so in our max tide, I mean, you'll see everything work out right. You'll have as much as, as 10 feet, you know. Golly, that's incredible. So. Yeah, you want to know where you, where you can and can't be when you've got 10 feet of water moving yep. in and out. <laughs> yeah, no, there's no question about it. So we have, uh, right now, you know, we're, we're recording this in the winter. So um, right now we're, uh, we're very low tide oriented if possible. Um, we've got gin clear water. Uh, and it's, and it's pretty chilly, but, uh, fish are pretty happy when we've had good enough, uh, sun and wind, uh, or lack of wind and all that to come together. Right. It's been a rare one this winter. Yeah. Usually when we, you know, we've had a pretty cold winter this year and usually when it's this cold, it kind of neutralizes the wind, but it's almost like we're staying on that edge and not getting quite cold enough for that to happen. Right. And, and not, uh. And, and, and it just, the wind just isn't wanting to go away. So, um, but, uh, I had a buddy of mine reach out the other day and say, is it, is this the coldest winter we've had in a long time or am I just getting soft? And I said, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. you sure are. And yes, it is. Yeah. So, that's a great answer. Um, but that being said, I mean, it hasn't, we haven't had one of those really nasty cold, you know, below freezing for three or four days overnight kind of stuff where we end up getting fish that get injured or, or die off or get, you know, I, a lot of the trout would end up getting eaten by dolphin before they start floating. But, um, so I, you know, that's been fortunate, but, um, but in terms of 
what we're doing right now, our fish are very schooled up in tight schools um, where we can where we can go and hunt them down in fairly skinny water. Um, it's actually helpful to have those dolphin around somewhat, helping to keep them a little skinnier. Yeah. Um, you will have times this time of year where it seems like the fish will want to sit a little bit because I think they're cold and and they're they're not ne- necessarily as as fast moving or gonna move as much but usually when the tide moves one way or the other whatever tide makes sense for them um they'll they'll get up and move uh, especially if you have a you know maybe you've got a little bit of out outgoing in the morning when it's cold and then as it, the water starts to warm a little bit with that sunlight and it starts to come in they'll they'll start to lift and move and yeah and the visuals this time of year are just amazing so oh, yeah um as you know and i mean i it i still our tailing stuff still probably the best visuals but being able to see these fish in those huge droves i mean i think sometimes people don't even can't even hardly get their head around seeing 200 fish all in the same school right coming at you. right and, you know you talk about your want to talk about your buck fever cast so definitely um, it's so funny it's, oh, it's sorry. the main thing we're doing this time of year redfish for sure certainly we have a lot more species that show up throughout the other parts of the year um we're also doing uh in select areas we're certainly going and throwing some clousers or some other some other uh kind of light colored patterns with some heavier eyes looking for trout and four yeah. or five feet away. um that's also been somewhat somewhat uh prolific lately it was better before it got this cold i felt like yeah what's a what is a big speckled trout for y'all down there mm. a big one's probably not a gigantic one but a big a big one's probably 21 22 inches yeah yeah that's yeah. a good one do y'all do y'all see eight to ten pound fish ever come out of that that area or, or not not as much as as our trout as far as your trout yeah sometimes sometimes you yeah do. and i would expect um i would expect if we can get through this winter without seeing much trout die off um which for us it seems like when we have trout die off it's not that you see a bunch of trout floating like right. i mentioned you know dolphin earlier for us it's more if you watch for these dolphin, they stop getting on the flats and harassing the redfish. They start busting and tearing things up in four or five feet of water off the edge of the flat, if not even maybe a little deeper. And uh, you get those really cold temperatures, and about, I don't know, about four to seven days later, you'll notice all the dolphin have really big bellies. Yeah. And that's, and just They just go and just terrorize those trout. I mean, the trout are probably going to die anyway when it gets that cold, but they will just go and eat them as soon as they start to slow down. Yeah, they just Um, can't outrun them. And so what I think will happen is we've had quite a few years. I don't know. I'm assuming you were there when we had that snow down here maybe Mm -hmm. five or six years ago. I don't know. Maybe it wasn't that long ago. It's probably three or four years ago. It was that big East Coast freeze maybe four or five years ago. And after that, we've only had good – we've had good winters that – that probably should give us continue it to give us healthy trout yeah that uh and so then i would expect to have you know same have the same conversation next year and we're probably 21 22 maybe 23 inch fish you right, know right uh, it definitely and but when we have a bad freeze and everything next year will be 11 12 inches yeah <laughs> it's that's kind of funny with trout the redfish seem to be a little hardier um, yes. i have seen some of the freezes though kill some redfish especially some of the smaller redfish that stay shallower. I think the bigger ones, they get smarter. They know to leave and, and get into deeper water. But, um, I've, you know, we've got a lot of these tight winding marsh creeks that, uh, that have a sand bottom. They don't hold much, you know, warmth at all in, in the winter. And there's so much tide and you'll see those things, you know, those, all those fish go belly up when it gets cold. We're kind of like on that edge right now of we need some warm weather. Cause that water yesterday was 43 degrees. Ooh. 44 degrees for a little bit and it's i'm sure some trout have died i don't think it's it's you know really crushed them yet but it's supposed to warm up to 55 60 degrees tomorrow so it, it should start bringing that that water back up but if we had another day or two of that we'd be it would be toast um, our water is around 48 i think gotcha yeah so it looks like uh some warmer weather around the corner which i'm excited for it, it always sucks this time of year you get to into january and it feels like spring. You're like, oh man, spring's right around the corner, and you still have February, and then March still gets cold, uh, and then April. And so, I don't know. I'm ready for it. So, as as far as y'all's y'all sight fishing and wintertime red fishing goes, what can someone expect down there? Like, say they came and booked a trip, and, and, and what what does that day kind of look like with you? So mostly we're kind of try to 
keep them to half or three quarter days yeah. um, because we're trying to fish that that low. Um, sorry, that's probably in there. That, oh, you're sound, good. That's fine. The um, um, the and then in terms of the uh, that low, we'll fish that low water. We we'll start probably. I like to start depending on how low it gets. Um, we'll we'll usually start um, approximately three hours before yeah and then fish into that low water and then fish up until it starts to really kind of get in the grass where we don't have much visibility anymore um and 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 but we're looking for big schools and usually they'll kind of they're very location dependent so um so we'll find those schools and we'll oftentimes can stay with them this time of year a lot more than we can other times of year yeah we might do more searching uh, up front, but once we find them, we essentially do less searching because we're we're kind of with them from that point. They usually don't make real big runs and take off down the flat and start splitting up and all that stuff. Um, but on the other hand, we don't have the schools, you know, the split off pods of twos and threes that we have in the uh, in the uh, months that are warmer, where those fish aren't as schooled up. I mean, they're schooled right. up then, but not like they are now. Yeah, definitely. So, um, and we and I throw a lot more, you know, natural colors this time of year with this with this cooler water or clearer water, so that you know um, if we're throwing a lot of blacks and purples and stuff in the other parts of the year to help silhouette better, um, I'm more likely to throw about. The, I'll throw some root beer kind of stuff yeah. just because it's a more natural color, but um, but sometimes that seems too aggressive, and the fish will want more tans and whites and things like that uh that won't silhouette as much so it's not quite as uh, aggressive in their face yeah if they're really turned on it you know any of it's fine but but sometimes having something a little more subtle is better yeah those real cold days they can definitely get piggy do you find this time of year that that having a heavier fly that's kind of dragging the bottoms better or getting that just something that'll suspend a little bit better does does better for you um it kind of depends on i'd usually have that more dependent on the bottom yeah um, if I can get away with something a little heavier, cause I have a firmer bottom, um, I think that the, for me, they, uh, I still like it down cause there's so much, they, they're built to look down. Right. Right. Uh, but if, uh, if we've got a real muddy bottom where we're fishing, then I'm something lighter, maybe a you know small yeah. bead chain eye with a little more body to it. So it, it'll still get down. Um, but it won't, it won't get itself under that mud layer. Um, you know, I remember we had a day in the winter, not, I don't know, a couple of years ago and we were fishing and we'd been doing really well with this little brown shrimp pattern that I had on there, but it had a lead eye in it. And, and then all of a sudden it just, we pulled down the flat, I don't know, 25 yards and put it right back into the fish and shut off, shut off, shut off, shut off. Wouldn't eat it. Wouldn't eat it. Wouldn't yeah. eat it. And so finally he gets hooked up on something and I reach down the line and I put my hand to what it's hooked up on. And when I reach down, I have to go into the mud column to find the stick that's under the mud column that he's caught on. And I'm like, Oh, well that explains it, you know? So, yeah. so quickly went away from that fly and went to the same fly with a little bead chain eye. And that was it. Yeah. So that's they, awesome. It's, it's yeah. funny. Those little nuances that you start to put together, you know, the more time spent sure. in the water and a little, little bits but yeah I, I would agree man here as well the the nat, the more natural color something that's not translucent but just kind of blends into the environment a little bit better you get something bright or something dark and it you know like you said when they're fired up it doesn't matter but when it's cold in the, in the 40s you want something really subtle i feel like um, is there a size that you kind of key in on this time of year fly wise that you're throwing i mean i'm still using most of the time i'm still using you know twos maybe a four yeah uh but yeah, uh, if the fish are fussy like you were just talking about, and the water's colder, I'm oftentimes going to a, you know, six or an eight and throwing some type of bonefish fly. Yeah. Uh, that in those natural colors, and that'll that'll send that'll get it done. Yeah. Yeah, that'll get it done. Is there a good spot down there to pick up flies if people need flies? Oh yeah, right here, Bay Street. <laughs> um, I, you know, there's really not. You know, obviously we, it's helpful not to have really anybody else selling most of what we have here right. uh, there's a little bit of overlap on that but um but uh, you know it's it 
that we have a good we try to keep a real good selection of fly we, flies we have some local tires that we bring stuff in on which has been really helpful during covid because as uh you know anybody that's run, running one of these shops retail wise knows a lot of this stuff has been tough to get because everybody wants to get outside so, right um so it's been nice to be able to support some local tires even more and you. uh and you know give them bigger orders try to fill these boxes to yeah. make sure good stuff that's awesome well, if you can, let's speak a little bit on, because I, I love to teach in this podcast as well and let people learn, but uh, a little bit about, you know, if someone that's listening to this podcast wants to go try this and they find themselves a school of redfish, maybe a little bit about in the wintertime, the approach on the fish and maybe casting angles, sure. just a little, you know, a little bit about that if you can. Okay. Um, yeah, I, uh, that in terms of, of what you, we'll start kind of with in terms of what you need to have cast wise yeah. in the winter versus a lot of the warmer weather stuff, tailing stuff and things like that. Um, I think a lot of times people, I hear it all the time. I had somebody the other day, I was fishing on the low water and he, he I was like, man, we've never fished a tailing tide together. And he's like, uh, he's like, yeah, I'm just not sure I'm ready for that. And I'm like, what do you, I'm, what do you mean you're not ready for it? And he's like, I'm not sure I'm good enough for that. I'm like, if yeah, I, I, I kind of think it's the other way around. Like, yeah. Um, if yeah, tailing wise, you got to be a little more accurate, but generally you don't have to cast. Sometimes you do, but generally you don't have to cast as far. The fish are preoccupied right. working the bottom they're feeding on stuff. Um, whereas these schools, you got, you know, if you got a hundred fish school and times how many ever thousands of scales they have on them, then on each fish, then you've got a bunch of fish that are, can be very aware that you're there, uh, with all those eyes and all this clear water. And, um, and so no, you don't have to be able to cast all the fly line, but, but a longer cast and knowing how to double haul this time of year yeah. can make a, a really big difference. Um, uh, that being said, you know, you'll look into some stuff otherwise too, but there's a, a huge difference there. The, um, and then the other piece of it in terms of what you were talking about with angles, uh, a lot of times what I'll see guys do, and this translates to a lot of fish and uh, pretty much all fish, certainly from a sight casting standpoint, but if you have fish coming to you or you have fish going, you know, across, uh, you know, straight across the bow or straight beside you, whatever the case is, how you apply angle and how you apply where that fish lay or where that fly lays down in consideration of what happens next when you strip the fly um can make a really big difference and so um if if you've got fish coming at you and they're on the left side or you know of the boat and you're casting off to the left up at that angle on those fish and you put that fly right in front of those fish well the next strip you're gonna have it back to the right of those uh, you know your right. right of the fish so you've got to have an angle that gets to the other side, to the left, to your left of those fish, and bring it back across them. Um, even more pronounced is if a fish is, say, crossing straight across the bow or coming straight down the side of the boat, you've got to make a cast to 9 o'clock or you've got to make a cast to 12 o'clock, essentially, to reach to get to that fish. You can make perfect cast and lay it right in front of him, but as soon as you strip it, you might be out of his strike zone now. Right. So uh, the same thing, you've got to get past it and bring it back to him. If you've got fish, um, if you've got fish that are obviously the the opposite, they're on to your right side of the boat or your one o'clock or so, and you're putting it to those fish. Same thing. If you put it on, you lay it in front of those fish. Now you're going to strip it back to yourself and. And, it, you know, at first blush, it seems like it would be the right thing to do. But you've got to think about how their line's drawn and how your line's going to be drawn so that you can get it in front of them. Um, the other piece is, too, depending on how close you lay it, where you lay it, you know, uh, how you manage with your line hand and your rod hand. Um, in fact, I just recorded a little video about this, probably be the next thing we'll put up for building anglers. But the um, uh, when if you get it out there and – you're fumbling around to get it from your left hand to your right hand and, and start stripping and, or you create slack by lifting the rod or you create slack when by laying it down wrong, whatever the case is, then, um, 
you you your fly may very well be laying there when the fish come by and you see it happen all the time too if you've got somebody that's pulling the boat quickly to get to fish and you lay it down you've got to think about the fact that you are still moving forward so you're that will create slack essentially as well um i've had that happen a, a fair amount lately where we've you know we've chased down a school which we often don't do in the warmer months but i'll, I'll do it this time of year where you can see them just so easily with this gin clear water right and as soon as they stop you can kind of put one up on that front edge and bring it back around them but you've got to you've got a pole so you've got to be prepared right uh, and sometimes that's also not a bad idea just to give it a second let the boat slow a little bit and then make the cast yeah uh, so that you're not taking all that part of that cast away yeah for uh, sure yeah and that so yeah if i was kind of preparing for the winter fishing before i came i would work on distance work on my double haul and i'd work on line management for when you take that cast when you make that cast to transition back to your to your rod hand to strip i'd work on the, on that timing and make sure you can do it as quickly as possible sweet so. i like that i i think that's one thing that you know people listen to this they're like oh i don't fly fish but that's one thing right there that you can really take from you know spin fishing fly fishing i don't care what you're doing those angles and understanding where the fish is where you need to cast and you know, so oftentimes with clients, you see the struggle of casting to where the fish was instead of really understanding the speed of the fish and putting a fly or soft plastic out in front of that fish. And, um, you know, the boat's moving, the fish is moving. There's all these variables. And, it, you know, for someone like you and I, that's not not like trying to tutor on horns or anything, but you spend a lot of time in the water, it kind of comes second nature. You're like, oh, I know where sure. this fly needs to be. And you forget to explain it correctly, you know, to people that might be out there for the first time. Um, but it's tricky, you know. You get a lot of people that are really good anglers, and then you start trying to sight fish with them, and it's a whole different ball game as far as, you know, instead of needing to land it on, you know, in an eight foot area, you got to land it in, in an eight inch area, um, which you know I think is why for a lot of people it's it's such an addicting and fun game, the fly fishing and um, the sight fishing in, in general, and it's just a great time. But that's one thing for sure that that I've noticed too, and I we do a lot of albacore fishing up here in the fall. Um, where you're talking about if you've got a pole fast after some fish, um, we'll see that with the albacore so often. You have someone that, that struggles quickly getting that fly um, moving or stripping or getting that. A lot of times with two hand strips, so you'll tuck the rod underneath your armpit. Sure. Um, and you'll, you know, you'll run up on these fish and come off plane and the boat's still probably moving at like five to eight knots. And you try to throw a cast out there and they'll go to strip and the line's already like back behind the boat. And <laughs> <laughs> it, waiting for that right time to cast can be very important. Yes. Um, well, you mentioned, and I was excited to bring to talk about this as well, um, and I've got it pulled up here on Instagram, but it, uh, you're, I, I guess it's it's called like an initiative, but building anglers is something that you're kind of leading up as far as, you know, building good fly anglers. You, will you want to speak into that a little bit? Yeah, so it all originated um, kind of mainly with Orvis and I talking about um, – about how a lot of instruction certainly outside of our area uh, more inshore you basically had presentations that were occurring at locations say in greenville south carolina or Asheville, north carolina or or uh, richmond or someplace like that there's a lot of freshwater instruction a lot of freshwater fly tying um, and then if anybody did show up to do a saltwater presentation that was more um, geared towards come fish with me you know, like I might go do one in, in Greenville and and do a presentation that was based around, you know, getting clients to come fish with me in Buford. Right. Um, and, uh, and that, you know, I've got a good client base, and so traveling to do that didn't make as much sense. But then we talked about how we could do presentations that would help people understand how to make their use of time on a flats boat uh, better. Um, and, and also just to kind of make it so that it wasn't so stressful, you know, right. I think a lot of people would look at a saltwater situation and say, I'm not ready for that. You know, just like that guy was saying, I'm not ready for tailing fish or I'm not, yeah, I, I do some trout fishing and, um, in the stream at home, but I may not be ready to travel out West to, to fish that type of water or, you know, it's something that they just, it's not that they're incorrect. Like it, it isn't that they're not ready for it. It's, it's that. It's something that they don't know much about, and so they get apprehensive and don't want to go do it. So, right, right. Uh, so we felt like if we could bring a flats boat to them, if we could bring 
you know, somebody that knew about, obviously, about saltwater fly fishing and, and the things that they could um, could work on beforehand, what things they needed, that they didn't have to make some massive investment in, in a whole bunch of gear before they went and did it, uh, that they'd be more comfortable to go make saltwater trips. So, yeah. um, so we, you know, I did a bunch of presentations at a bunch of Orvis stores, uh, a lot of Orvis events, what they call game fair, um, and, and then some other venues that weren't Orvis related. Um, and we were supposed to do one, uh, we were supposed to do a fly fishing and wine festival up from Virginia, um, early this month. But obviously what has happened with that whole, with the whole building anglers outline was that, uh, with COVID that a lot of these, none of these events are taking place. Right. So, um, we're kind of revamping and going to work on doing a lot more, uh, just short instructional kind of videos yeah, okay. um, and get those out uh, on the building anglers page. Most of it's been more uh, all the presentations that were before and then really more my guiding and, and fishing side there. But now um, I've gotten a pretty good library of videos that um, that'll be up more readily uh, here Same. coming out just as short little videos like the one I just did uh, about, simply about how to connect a reel to to a fly rod properly and so many people have come to me and been like i never knew that like you know the fact that uh you know in the video i talk about you know if you tighten everybody all of us for until somebody told us different we tighten one nut down and then we tighten the other nut down against it never thought about backing one off just a bit to tighten them against each other and then therefore they don't go anywhere and yeah, it's that, one of those, that's pretty it's smart. One of those little things that most people had no idea. Right. So, um, so it's the kind of thing where I think we're gonna. I'm hoping that with everybody, especially now with COVID, you know, we're seeing everybody wants to get outside and and do things, which has been great for our industry. But uh, but how can we make the saltwater stuff even more accessible uh, now more than ever? Right. Uh, without being able to go to these bigger, bigger venues and presentations and bring it to them. So, um, and that, you know, that, that I think we'll get back to that somehow or another. There's been, there's some other things on the docket for the coming year to go do. Um, it's just a matter of watching and seeing, uh, of those things, what we can, what we can make yeah. happen and what makes sense safely. Uh, you were mentioning, you know, things that we might not have thought of, you know, as fly anglers or people don't don't realize I had a client one time show me putting a rod together. I've always, you know, grabbed the reel handle and then put the next section on and then put the next section on. And he was like, you know, you need to start with the rod tip. So then when you get done, you're holding the handle and you're not sitting there trying to get the tip, the tip of the rod on when the, the butt's yep. banging around. And I was like, that is the smart. I mean, how have I never thought about that? But there's just yep. and so I, many little things. Never have. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, so. uh, it's funny. Um, well, I'll definitely, I'm going to link all of that stuff so people can check it out and, it's definitely the age of video now with COVID more than ever. Sure. I mean, it already was, but but that's super cool, man. I think that's one place that people miss the boat a lot. I get, I know you do as well. You'll get a bunch of, you know, fly fishing clients that have fished the the you know Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia mountains for trout. You know, maybe they fished a long time their whole life and they want to come catch redfish. And and sometimes you, I mean, it, it's tough, but you kind of have to lay out the expect not the expectations but manage expectations and kind of let people know hey you know it's a lot different than than trout fishing and and i think that's kind of a cool thing that um you know that's a conversation i always have on the phone or over email a little bit and um i think that's another cool thing with building anglers that people kind of understand okay this is kind of what's you know required you know it's not going to be the shorter cast and mending you know the fly line and fishing sure. dry flies and um, so that, that's super cool, man. I, I know, you know, my first couple of times I ever saltwater fishing, um, I had no clue what I was doing. So it, having, having a resource like that to, to know, because there's so much fly fishing content out there. Um, but it's all just like, you know, hero video stuff where it, it makes it look easy. It's, you know, it's the instructional side of saltwater fly fishing. There's not a bunch there. So that's super well, it's cool. like what you were saying earlier about, I mean, you and I, we get, even though. You know, I, I'd much rather be on the back of the boat pushing the boat, but, but the, but what that affords us is being there and seeing an angle, seeing seeing a shot missed, seeing a shot made, you know, seeing the correct strip, seeing the right set, seeing right. the wrong set, all those things 
that most people don't get to see, at least not very often. And, and so, you know, we know where we want, you know, the best place to put the fly and it, it isn't something that we really think that much about. Well, you know, that's exactly the opposite of what most people get to experience. So, right. um, and I, so I understand why it makes it more stressful and, um, and it's no different. Like the best, the best anglers I have, they look like they do could care less up there. You know, they, <laughs> they, they want to catch fish, but for the most part, they just want to get outside and go have a good time. And if they get a shot or they miss a shot or they make a shot, whatever the case is, all right, on to the next one. Right. Uh, but it's, you know, they've been there before. So, um, trying to bring that. And that was the whole, you know, the purpose of building anglers originally and why it's been tough to transfer it over to now is it so much of it was about getting away from, from this digital stuff and and bringing everything boat wise rod wise all of it so they yeah. can see how simple it was in person um and so i've had to that's that's had to that's gonna gotcha. have to change and, and it has changed so gotcha um it, yeah that's I, I think one of the the coolest things and i just kind of had this this thought here but about being the type of fishing guide that, that you and i have the ability you know this sight fishing and fly fishing um you're way more of a team fishing together than any other type of fishing guide really you know the guy on the back and the guy on the front have to work together and understand each other and know what each other are capable of um, to catch fish and i think that builds you know even stronger and more long-term client guide relationships and friendships and um, you know my buddies that i that i go and fly fish with on my days off are my best buddies you know and we know each other real well and um that plays true on the boat i mean i know you've probably seen it with clients the clients that you've even if they're not the best, maybe your best fisherman, you're better at maybe fishing with them because you understand exactly what both of y'all can sure. do. So, sure. Well, um, I think we're gonna we're we're at about uh, forty yeah, forty one minutes here, so we can wrap it up. If there's anything else with building anglers or, or the fly shop down there, or your guide business, and obviously I'm gonna link all that on here. Um, okay. But if there's anything else you want to dive into before we hop off, I don't know. Yeah, if I... and I think I think the biggest thing with building anglers, it's really kind of surprised me, and I want to I offer it to anybody who's listening, watching, whatever, um, is the the massive amounts of questions that have come in to say, all right, well, I'm taking a trip to Cuba or I'm taking a trip to Belize. Um, I don't. I don't really know what I need, but I have this massive book that says I need all this stuff and, and I'm happy to answer and, and say, you know, there's a lot of stuff as you well know, (laughs) you know, you book a trip at, at destination Y lodge, then they're going to give you a novel of things all the way to six different power converters you need. And, and, (laughs) and it's obviously unrealistic and you don't need, you don't need most of the stuff. So, um, and that's probably been the thing that I've seen the most is people trying to, you know, talk about, well, when I go to fish such place, what do I really need? Um, you know, some, and for you and me, most people can pretty much show up and so long as they got a pair of sunglasses and, and a hat and clothes that they can be comfortable in and non-marking shoes, we probably got everything else they need. Right. So, um, but that's not always the case everywhere. And it may not be the case. Maybe you want to have your own such and such to come fish here, or come fish in Charleston, or whatever. So um, that that's the kind of thing that because I've seen so much of it come in, um, you know, people can reach out to me at tuck at buildinganglers dot com, and I'm happy to respond to those questions awesome. and help people. With that. Well, that's that's cool, man. Um, again, thank you so much for coming on, you guys. If y'all are listening to this, uh, me and Tuck are going to hop on Patreon. And I figured what we could probably do is just go over kind of, you know, your fly setup stuff. It, you know, if someone wants to get into the sport, what they can, you know, what they need to get as far as, um, you know, gear and is fly rods, flies, leader, tippet, every, everything. So um, if y'all did enjoy this podcast, you guys definitely uh, hit Tuck up, go book a trip down there with him. Um, I hate to say it, but their red fishing is a lot better than our red fishing in North Carolina. So uh, get down there and, and see what our fishery really could be like if we got our, got our crap together. So. Man, thank you so much for coming on here, and we'll have to do another one and and, uh, get you back on here. Cool, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. Later, guys.